Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Jason's Bedtime Story Time. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And the idea behind this podcast is for me to read you a nice little bedtime story. And you can drift away into a wonderful slumber of sleepiness. So, I'll just have a look at what I'm going to do. I'm going to read you a book, a very famous one, but it's the original version from. Trying to see what year it is. According to this, it's hmm. Well, I've got it from Guttenberg.org. It's an open source book, which means I'm allowed to read it. I can't get the actual date on when it was first released. Anyway, it is Sleeping Beauty and other fairy stories or other fairy tales from the old French. Um, So I'm just going to read Sleeping Beauty. So Sleeping Beauty is what I'm going to read. Isn't that exciting? So I'm just going to see how long it lasts. That's quite a big book. It's quite a fair... So I'll read Sleeping Beauty today, and then next time maybe I'll read Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Oops, Bluebeard. And Bluebeard maybe, and... Okay. So this is The Sleeping Beauty. So get yourself nice and comfortable. And if you're going to, you know, go to sleep, lying down on a bed might be useful. If you're standing in a corner of the room, balancing on one leg, that might not be ideal. So, you know, get yourself so you're comfortable where you can enjoy a lovely, relaxing bedtime story. And you can just drift off to sleep. So according to this, um, Arthur Kula Couch, is that the person that wrote this book? I think. Um, illustrated by Edmund Dulac. It was published in New York. Huh. So my, I think, from what I can see, is it was a French story that was re, re what's it did, you know, interpreted, reinterpreted, or uh, you know. In New Yorkies. So here we go. The Sleeping Beauty. Once upon a time, there lived a king and a queen who lacked but one thing on earth to make them entirely happy. The king was young, handsome and wealthy. The queen had a nature as good and gentle as her face was beautiful. And they adored one another, having married for love. 
which among kings and queens is not always the rule. Moreover, they reigned over a kingdom of peace and their people were devoted to them. What more then could they possibly want? Well, they wanted one thing very badly and the lack of it grieved them more than words can tell. They had no child. Vows, pilgrimages, all ways were tried. Yet for a long while, nothing came of it all, and the poor queen especially was in despair. I've never tried vows and pilgrimages. Um, I do know another way of... <laughs> At last, however, to her own and her husband's inexpressible joy, she gave birth to a daughter. As soon as the palace guns announced this event, why didn't he get people to do it? The whole nation went wild with delight. Flags waved everywhere. Bells were set peeling until the steeples rocked. How do you peel a bell? It's made of metal, isn't it? Crowds tossed up their hats and cheered while the soldiers presented arms. I mean, it's, they've all got arms. Well, you know, generally. Presented their arms. What to the queen? Look. Here's my legs. Here's my ears. And even strangers meeting in the street fell upon each other's neck. Fell upon each other's neck. Were they drunk? How do you fall on someone's neck? Were they wrestling? Um, so me, strangers meeting in the street fell upon each other's neck, exclaiming, Our king, no, no, sorry, our queen has a daughter. Yes, yes, our queen has a daughter. Long live the little princess. A name had now to be found for the royal babe. And the king and queen, after talking over some scores of names, at length decided to call her Aurora, which means the dawn. The dawn itself, thought they, was never more beautiful than this darling of theirs. The next business, of course, was to hold a christening. They agreed that it must be a magnificent one, and as a first step, they invited all the fairies they could they could find in the land to be godmothers to the princess Aurora that each one of them might bring her a gift as was the custom 
with fairies in those days. And so she might have all the perfections imaginable. Bit greedy, weren't they? I mean, they are king and queens. So they... Can you imagine that? Inviting people to your wedding because you're going to get gifts. You know, just inviting complete strangers. Like invite the whole town, the whole city, invite the whole country. Come, come to my wedding. I mean, you can never have too many toasters. Anyway, uh, I don't know when they said the fairies bring gifts. Whether it's gifts like magical gifts or you know, like little dresses or you know. They stick a dynamite, but that's not really a very nice gift, is it? Laptop. I don't know. Wheelbarrow. After making long inquiries, for I should tell you that all this happened not so many hundred years ago, when fairies were already growing somewhat scarce, they found seven. That wasn't his name, it was the number of fairies. But this again pleased them because seven is a lucky number. Okay, bit of superstition going on here. After the ceremonies of the christening, while the trumpeters sounded their fanfares and the guns boomed out again from the great tower, all the company returned to the royal palace to find a great feast arrayed. Arrayed, that's a word we don't really use anymore, isn't it? Uh. Seats of honour had been set for the seven fairy godmothers, and before each was laid a dish of honour, with a dish covered of solid gold, and beside the dish a spoon a knife and a fork all of pure gold and all set with diamonds and rubies bit over the top but yeah but just as they were seating themselves at table Oh, that's bad grammar, isn't it? At the table. Perhaps they didn't have grammar back then. I mean, they're showing off with some of their words, like arrayed. But missed out the the. With a dish cover of... Oh, but just as they were seating themselves at, at table. Maybe it's northern. Just as they were seating themselves at table. To the dismay of everyone, there appeared in the doorway an old crone. Dressed in black and leaning on a crutched stick. A crutch. Her chin and her hooked nose almost met together. Like a pair of nutcrackers. For she had very few teeth remaining, but between them she growled to the guests in a terrible voice. I'm the ugly Iglaine. Pray, where are your king's manners that I have not been invited? She had in fact been overlooked, and this was not surprising because she lived at the far end of the country 
in a lonely tower set around by the forest. For fifty years she had never come out of this tower, but she stunk, and everyone believed her to be dead or enchanted. That, you must know, is the commonest way the fairies have of ending. They lock themselves up in a tower or within a hollow oak and are never seen again. Huh. The king, though she chose to accuse his manners, was in fact the politest of men. He hurried to express his regrets, led her to table. Maybe it's just, just one table in existence at this time. It was just one table, so he didn't like the table because it was just one table. And okay, so he led her to the table with his own hand and ordered a dish to be set for her. But with the best will in the world, he could not give her a dish cover such as the others had, because seven only had been made up for the seven invited fairies. The old crone received his excuses very ungraciously while accepting a seat. It was plain that she had taken a deep offence. One of the younger fairies, Hippolyta, uh, Hippolyta by name, who sat by, overheard her mumbling threats between her teeth I mean, how big were the gaps? And fearing that she might bestow some unlucky gift upon the little princess, went as soon as she rose from the table and hid herself close by the cradle. Behind the tapestry, behind the tapestry, that she might have the last word and undo, so far as she could, what evil the fairy Ooglain Gluyani might leave in her mind, might have in her mind. Ugliani, Ulan, Ugliani, see, ugly. Well, no, that's where the word ugly came from. Wow. Isn't that interesting? She had scarcely concealed herself before the other fairies began to advance, one by one, to bestow their gifts to the princess. The youngest promised her that she should be the most beautiful creature in the world. After Ombre the Ferret. The next, that she should have the wit of an angel. The third, a marvellous grace in all her ways, the fourth, that she should dance to perfection, the fifth, that she should sing like a nightingale, the sixth, that she should play exquisitely on all instruments of music. I think I'd have preferred a toaster. Now came the turn of the old fairy, Ugly Ain. Her head nodded with spite and old... <laughs> well, her head nodded with spite and old age together as she bent over the cradle and shook her crutched staff above the head of the princess.
pretty babe, who slept on sweetly, too young, too innocent, as yet to dream of any such thing as a mischief in this world. This is my gift for you, Princess Aurora, announced the hag, still in a creaky voice that shook as spitefully as her body. I promise that one day you shall pierce your hand with a spindle, and on that day you shall surely die. Oh, lovely night. Night time story for children. At these terrible words, the pure queen, poor queen, fell back fainting into her husband's arms. A trembling seized the whole court. The ladies were in tears, and the younger lords and knights were calling out to seize and burn the wicked witch. When the young fairy stepped forth from behind the tapestry and passing by ugly Ain, who stood scornful in the midst of this outcry, this outcry, she thus addressed their magistrates. Take comfort, O king and queen. Not all that shall not die thus. It is true. I have not the power wholly to undo what this elder sister of mine has done. The princess must indeed pierce her hand with a spindle, but instead of dying, she shall only fall into a deep slumber that shall last for many, many years, at the end of which the king's son shall come and wake her. Whenever this misfortune happens to your little Aurora, do not doubt that I, the fairy, Hippolyta, her grandmother, shall get news of it and come at once to render what bell by me. The king, while declaring himself infinitely obliged to the good Fairy Hippolyta could not help feeling that hers was but cold comfort at the best. He gave orders to close the Christian festivities at once. Although the fairy ugly aim, their spoil, spoiled joy had already taken her departure, passing unharmed through the crowd of folk each one of whom wished her ill, and the ride in a way it was generally agreed upon a broomstick. Generally agreed. But it was in a Ford Fiesta. Let's just say it's a, a broomstick, that'd be easy, wouldn't it? Put a chikachancho or something, but no one could pronounce it. Yeah, it's for chikachinchu, chikachuchu, chikachancho. Ah, broomstick. It's easier. To satisfy the king's faithful subjects, however, who were unaware of any misadventure, the palace fireworks were duly let off with a grand set piece, wishing long life to the princess Aurora. In all the colours of the rainbow, yeah, but his majesty, after bowing from the balcony amid the banging of rockets and the hissing of Catherine wheels, retired to a private room with his chamberlain, and there, still amid the noise of explosions and cheering, drew up the first harsh proclamation of his reign. It forbade everyone on pain of death, to use a spindle in spinning or even to have a spindle in their house. Heralds took copies of this proclamation and marched through the land reading it 
to the sound of trumpets. I would have thought a triangle would be better, wouldn't it? Because trumpets are quite loud. You could hear over a triangle. Trumpets, do they say spindle or crindle or shingle? He doesn't want us to what? I can't hear over the trumpet. He doesn't. We're not allowed to do what? What? I can't still go. Oh, that matter. That would be important. So. Let me have a look. What's next? So, uh, so, okay. so they took its trumpets to, they, for every marketplace. They sort of uh, it gravely puzzled and distressed all who listened. I guess spindles were very popular back then. For their women folk prided themselves on their linen. It's good to have pride, isn't it? You should see my linen. I got the best linen in town. Its finesse was a byword throughout the neighbourhood kingdom. And they knew some themselves to be famous for it. But what sort of linen, said they, would his majesty have us spin without spindles? A sewing machine? I don't know. Why don't you just go to the shops and buy them? Go to Amazon. They had a great affection, however, as we have seen, for their monarch. And for 15 or 16 years, all the spinning wheels were silent throughout the land. The little princess Aurora. Aurora, not Aurora, Aurora. Uh, grew up without ever having seen one. But one day the king and queen, being absent at one of their country houses, she gave her governess the slip and running at will through the palace and upstairs and from one chamber to another. She came at length to a turret with a winding staircase from the top of which a strange whirring sound attracted her and seemed to invite her to climb. So a whirring sound attracted her to climb. Okay. As she mounted after the sound, on a sudden it ceased, but still she followed the stairs and came at the very top to an open door through which she looked in upon a small garret where sat an honest old woman alone winding her distaff I'm not sure what a distaff is the good soul had never in 16 years heard of the king's Prohibition against spindles. And this is just the sort of thing that happens in palaces. Really? Okay. Uh, so. What are you doing, Goody? Asked the princess. I am spinning, pretty one, answered the old woman, who did not know who she was. Spinning what? What is it? I wonder sometimes, said the old woman, what the world is coming to in these days. And that, of course, was natural enough. Oh, no. And that, of course, <laughs> was natural enough and might occur to anybody after living so long 
as she had lived in a garret on the top of a tower. Spinning, she said wisely. She liked to say the word spinning quite a lot. Spinning, she said. It's spinning. Or was. Or was. And gentle or simple. No one is fit to keep house until they had learned to spin. <clears throat> Her voice was very croaky for some reason. How pretty it is, said the princess. How do you do it? Give it to me and let me see if I can do so well. She had no sooner grasped the spindle, spindle and she was over eager perhaps just a little bit clumsy or perhaps the fairy decree had so ordained it that it pierced her hand and she dropped down in a swoon Ooh, she swooned the oh <laughs> I can't believe they call it the old trot in a flurry the old trot it's not nice is it the old trot in a flurry ran to the head of the stairs and called for help. There was no bell rope, and her voice being weak with age and a turret in the remotest, remotest corner of the palace, it was long before anyone heard her in the servants' hall. The servants, too, in the absence of the king and the queen, were playing cards and it could not be interrupted by anybody until their game was finished. Then they sat down and discussed whose business it was to attend on a call from that particular turret. This again proved to be a nice point, since nobody could remember having been summoned hither. Or hither. And all were against setting up a president, as they called it. In the end, they decided to send up the lowest of the junior page boys. But he had a weakness, which he somehow forgot to mention, that of fainting at the sight of blood. So when he reached the garret and fainted, the old woman had to begin screaming again. Okay. I mean, I suppose fainting at the sight of blood doesn't generally come up, does it? Maybe you're going to work in a hospital. Maybe. You know, if you're, if you're volunteering at the, the blood centre, you know, giving blood, then yeah, you would mention it. This time they set up a scullery maid, who being good-natured and unused to the ways of the palace, made the best haste and she could that she could to get to the garret, whence presently she returned with the terrible news. The servants, who had gone back to their game, now dropped their cards and came running. All the household, in fact, came pouring up to the turret stairs. The palace physicians themselves crowded in such numbers that the poor Princess Aurora would have been hard to put it hard put it for fresh air could fresh air have restored her could, if, if fresh air had been able to restore her she might have been struggled to get it I think that's the point they dashed water on her face I hope it was water unlaced her yeah slapped her hands tickled the soles of her feet so they were very up to date in their techniques back then. Burned feathers under her nose. Rubbed her temples with hungry water. Not like it wasn't hungry as in oh, I need to eat. But hungry as from the country. So they travelled all the way to Hungary to get water. Well, I'm sure we'll just tap water. Or Romanian water. Uh, they held consultations over her by twos and threes and again in grand committee 
but nothing would bring her to. Meanwhile, a messenger had ridden off post-haste with the tidings, and while the doctors were still consulting and shaking their heads, the king himself came galloping home to the palace. In the midst of his grief, he bethought him of what the fairies had foretold, and being persuaded that since they had said it, it was fated to happen. He blamed no one, but gave orders to carry the princess to the finest apartment in the palace, and there lay her on a bed embroidered with gold and silver. At sight of her, she was so lovely, you might well have supposed that some bright being of the skies had floated down to earth and then dropped her dropped sleep after her long journey. Like an angel, I guess, I'm trying to say. For her swoon had not taken away the warm tints of her complexion. Her cheeks were like carnations. Her lips like coral. As a betting shop. And though her eyes were closed and the long lashes would not lift, her soft breathing told that she was not dead. The king commanded them all to leave her and let her sleep in peace until the hour of her awakening should arrive. Now, when the accident befell our princess, the good fairy Hippolyta, who had saved her life, happened to be in the kingdom of Martaquin, 12,000 leagues away. But news of it was brought to her in an incredibly short space of time by a little dwarf who owned a pair of seven league boots. These were boots and <laughs> these were boots in which you could walk seven leagues at a single stride. Okay. She set off at once to help her beloved goddaughter, and behold, in an hour this good fairy arrived at the palace in a fiery chariot drawn by dragons. I'm not sure if there's a little bit of exaggeration in this. Mm. Our king met her and handed her down from the chariots. Gave her a hand down, I think that's what I mean, helped her out, helped her down. She approved of all that she had done, but greatly foreseeing as she was, she bethought that he thought her that as all mortals perish within a hundred years or so, when the time came for the princess to awaken, she would be distressed to find herself orphaned and alone in this old castle. So this is what she did. She touched with her wand everything and everybody in the palace, the king and the queen the ministers and the privy councillors. Is that people in charge of the toilet? A privy. The archbishop, who was the grand almoner, the bishops and the minor clerks, or clergy, clergy, the maids of honour, ladies of the bedchamber. They actually had ladies in charge of collecting poo and we. Uh, governors, governesses, gentlemen in waiting, equerries, heralds, physicians, officers, masters of the household, cooks, scullions, lackeys, 
guards, switzers. I have no idea what a switzer is. But I want one. I really, really want one. It's all I want. The pages, footmen. She touched the princess's tutors and the court professors in the midst of their deep studies. She touched likewise all the horses in the stables with the grooms, the huge mastiffs in the yard, even tiny, the princess's little pet dog, and Fluff, her black and white cat that lay coiled on a cushion by her bedside. The instant the fairy Hippolyta touched them, they all fell asleep, not to awaken until the same moment as their mistress, that all might be ready to wait on her when she needed them. The very spits at the fire went to sleep, loaded as they were with partridges and pheasants, and the fire went to sleep too. All this was done in a moment. The fairies were never long about the businesses in those days. But it so happened that one of the king's counsellors, the minister of marine, his office dated from a previous reign when the kingdom had hoped to conquer and acquire a seaboard, had overslept himself that morning. So he didn't get put to sleep because he was asleep. So I guess when she was checking around, everyone actually was asleep. But he was naturally asleep. And so he had overslept himself and he came late to the palace without any knowledge of what had been befallen. He felt no great, he felt no great fear that his unpunctuality would be remarked. And a ferret jumped onto a black chair in the same room as the person reading the story. For some reason. He felt no great fear that his unpunctuality would be remarked. The king, as he supposed, being absent in the country, nevertheless he took the precaution of letting himself in by a small postern door, and so missed being observed by the fairy and touched by her wand. Entering his office and perceiving that his under security usually so brisk, and all his clerks resting their heads on their desks in attitudes of sleep, he drew the conclusion that something had, <laughs> had happened, for he was an excellent judge of natural slumber. Okay, let's get this uh, sorted. So he came in, the Minister of Marine, he came in to the palace and saw everyone asleep. He drew the conclusion that something had happened, for he was an excellent judge of natural slumber. The farther he penetrated into the palace, the stronger his suspicions became. Yeah. Quick. He withdrew on tiptoe, though by nature and habit a lazy man, he was capable of sudden decision, and returning to his home, he caused notices to be posted up, forbidding anyone to approach the castle. The inmates of which were suffering from eastern but temporary affliction, known as the sleeping sickness. So it's also very creative as well. These notices were unnecessary, and within a few hours they grew up all around the park, 
such a number of trees of all sizes and such a tangle of briars and undergrowth that neither beast nor man could find a passage. They grew until nothing but the tops of the castle towers could be seen and there's and these only for one a good way off. I'm not sure if that made sense. There was no mistaking about it. The fairies had done her work well and the princess might sleep with no fear of visits from the Inquisitor. One day, many, many years afterwards, the incomparable young prince Florimond happened to ride a hunting on the side of the country which lay next to the tangled forest and asked, What were those towers he saw pushing up amongst the midst of green wood? They all answered him as they heard tell. Some said it, was said it was an old castle haunted by ghosts. Others that all the wizards and witches of the countries met there to keep Sabbath. The most general option was that an ogre dwelt there and that he carried off hither all the children he could catch to eat them at his ease. Again, what a wonderful children's story. No one could follow him for he alone knew how to find a passage through the briars and brambles. The prince could not tell which to believe of all these informants, for all gave their versions with equal confidence, as commonly happens with those who talk absolute rubbish. Oh no, for those, it commonly happens with those who talk on matters of which they can know nothing for certain. He was turning from one to another in perplexity when a peasant spoke up and said, Your Highness, long ago I heard my father tell that there was in yonder castle a princess, the most beautiful that ever man saw, that she must lie asleep up there for many, many years and that one day she will be awakened by a king's son, for whom she was destined. As these words, Prince Florimond felt himself a fire. He had a little movement. He could feel a twitching beneath his belly button. He believed without weighing it, that he could accomplish this fine adventure and spurred on by love and ambition, he resolved to explore then and there and discover the truth for himself. Leaping down from his horse, he started to run towards the wood and had almost reached the edge of it before the attendant courtiers guessed his design. They called him to come back but he ran on and was about to fling himself boldly into the undergrowth when as by magic all the great trees the shrubs the creepers the ivies the briars and the brambles unlaced themselves of their own accord and drew aside to let him pass he found himself within a long glade of or avenue at the end of which glimmered the walls of an old castle and towards this he strode it surprised him somewhat that none of his attendants were following him the reason being that as soon as he had passed through it the undergrowth grew close as ever again he heard their voices fainter and fainter behind him. Beyond the barrier, calling, beseeching him to desist. But he held on his way without one backward look. He was a prince, and young, and therefore valiant. 
he came to the castle and pushing aside the ivies that hung like a curtain over the gateway entered a wide outer court and stood still for a moment holding his breath while his eyes travelled over a scene that might well have frozen them with terror. The court was silent, dreadfully silent. It was by no means empty. On all hands lay straight, stiff bodies of men and beasts, seemingly all dead. Nevertheless, as he continued to gaze, his courage returned, for the pimpled noses and ruddy faces of the Switzers, whatever they are, told him that they were no worse than asleep, and their cups, which yet held a few heel taps of water, proved that they had fallen asleep over a bin a drinking bout. He stepped by them and passed across a second great court paved with marble. He mounted a broad flight of marbled steps leading to the main doorway. He entered a guard room just within the doorway where the guards stood in rank with shouldered muscles or shouldered muskets, every man, every man of them asleep and snoring his best. He had to laugh. Uh, he made his way through a number of rooms filled with ladies and gentlemen, some standing, s others sitting, but all asleep. He drew aside a heavy purple curtain and once more held his breath, for he was looking into the great hall of state where, at a long table, a table sat and slumbered the king with his council. The Lord Chancellor slept in the act of dipping pen into inkpot. The Archbishop in the act of taking snuff, and between the spectacles of the Archbishop's nose and the spectacles of the Lord Chancellor's, a spider had spun a beautiful web. And that's an image. Prince Florimond tiptoed very carefully past these august sleepers and leaving the hall by another door, came to the foot of the grand staircase. I nearly said suitcase there. He up this too he went, wandering along a corridor to his right, and stopping by hazard at one of the many doors, opened it and looked into a bath room lined with mirrors and having in its mist sunk in the floor a huge round basin of whitest porcelain wherein a spring of water bubbled deliciously. Three steps led down to the bath and at the head of them stood a couch with towels and court suit, suit or court suite laid ready exquisitely embroidered and complete to the daintiest of lace ruffles and the most delicate of body linen. The prince bethought him that he had ridden far before ever come into the wood, and the mirrors told him that he had also somewhat travel he was almost somewhat travel stained from his passage through it. It was dirty in the woods. So having by this time learned to accept any new wonder without question, he undressed himself and took a bath. Because that's what you do, isn't it? Go into a castle, 
every single person is asleep. You take a bath, wouldn't you? That's the next possible option. And what else would you do? Wow. He thoroughly enjoyed it. Nor was he altogether astonished when he tried on the clothes to find that they fitted him perfectly. Even the rosetted shoes of satin might have been made to his measure. Having arrayed himself thus hardily, he resumed his quest along the corridor. The very next door, the very next door, he tried opened on a chamber, all panelled with white and gold, and there, on a bed of curtains, on which were drawn wide, he beheld the loveliest vision he had ever seen. A large, thin pizza, covered with sweet corn and pineapple. Now that would be my loveliest vision. His vision was a princess, seemingly about 17 or 18 years old, and of a beauty so brilliant that he could not have believed this world held the like. But she lay still, so still, still laying still, still. Prince Florimond drew near, trembling and wondering. What would it take to wake her up? Would she wake up easily? <laughs> How much could he get away with her? And sank on his knees beside her. Still she lay, scarcely seeming to breathe, and he bent and touched with his lips the little hand that had rested, light as a rose leaf on the coverlet. With that, as the long spell of her enchantment came to an end, the princess awakened. As he touched it, kissed her hand and looked at him. So she awakened, looked at him with eyes more tender than a first sight of him might seem to excuse. It is you, my prince. Oh, wait a minute. It is you, my prince, she said. You have been a long while coming. The prince, charmed by these words and still more by the manner in which they were spoken, so beautifully and so gently, knew not how to find words for the bliss in his heart. He assured her that he loved her better than his own self. Their speak after this was very coherent. Their speech they gazed at one another for long stretches then they talked but if eloquence lacked there was plenty of love he to be sure showed the more embarrassment and no need to wonder at this she had had time to think over what to say to him for i hold it not unlikely although the story does not say anything of this that the good fairy Hippolyta had taken care to amuse her during her long sleep with some pleasurable dreams. In short, the Princess Aurora and the Prince Florimond conversed for hours and still without saying the half they had to say. And he thought, what was that din noise? He didn't understand it. And she didn't understand it either. Very strange. Ding, ding, ding. Meanwhile, all the palace had awakened with the princess. In the council chamber, the king opened his eyes and requested the Lord Chancellor to read that last sentence of his over again a little more distinctly. The Lord Chancellor, dipping his quill into the dry ink spot, asked the Archbishop in a whisper 
how many tears there were in regrettable. The Archbishop, taking a pinch of snuff that had long ago turned to dust, answered with a terrific sneeze, which again was drowned by the striking of all the clocks in the palace as they started frantically to make up for lost time. Maybe that's what that ding was, it was one of the clocks. Dogs barked, doors banged, the princess's parrots screamed in his cage and were answered by the peacocks squawking from the terrace. Amidst, amid which hubbub, the minister of agriculture, of agriculture, forgetting his manners, made a trumpet of his hands and bawled across the table, begging his majesty to adjourn for dinner. In short, everyone's first thought was of his own business, and as they were still, as, as they were not at all in love, they were ready to die with hunger. That doesn't really make sense, but anyway. Well, as they were not all in love, they were ready to die with hunger. Even the Queen, who had dropped asleep while discussing with her maids of honour the shade of mourning, which was most properly expressed regret for royal personages in a trance, lost her patience at length and sent one of her attendee, attendants with word that she, for her part, was keen set for something to eat, and that in her young days it had been customary for young ladies released from enchantment to accept the congratulations of their parents without loss of time. The, plin the Prince Florimond, by this message recalled to his devours, devours, devoirs, helped the princess to rise. She was completely dressed and very magnificently too. Taking his beloved Princess Aurora by the hand, he led her to her parents, who embraced her passionately and uh, embraced her passionately. Where is it? Embraced. <laughs> lost the thing and said hi are you alright he said yeah I'm fine thanks you yeah that's good and she said here's, here's my prince I'm going to get married to him he said oh that's nice is it dinner ready yet and I uh, said no he said, I'd love to hear about your you know being in love and that but I'm hungry and the queen said to be honest with you if we don't get some food soon I'm going to eat the prince they all laughed. The situation, to be sure, was delicate, but when these two kings, both so well-meaning, had met and exchanged courtesies, and the one had raised the other by the hand to a place on the dais beside him, already and without speech they had almost accorded. So the princess fireworks I am an old man, said the princess's father, the princess's father. I have reigned long enough for my satisfaction, and now care for little in life but to see my son happy. I think I can promise you that, said the princess. Oh, I think I can promise you that, said the princess's father, smiling with a glance at the two lovers. I am old enough at any rate to have done with ambitions, said the one. And I too, said the other, have dreamt long enough at any rate to despise them. What matters ruling to either of us two, while we see your son and my daughter reigning together? So it was agreed then and there, and after supper, without loss of time, the Archbishop married the Prince Florimond, and the Princess Aurora in the chapel of, of the castle. 
So they might travel to another town and just did it there. It makes sense. The two kings and the princess's mother saw them to their chamber and the first maid of honour drew the curtain. They slept little. The princess had no occasion. But the prince next morning left his bride back to the city where they were acclaimed by the populace and lived happily ever after, reigning in prosperity and honour. And there's a little bit here at the end. Moral. Ye maids to await some a while a lover fond, rich titled debonairs as Florimond. Is reason and who loans on fate to attend, goes seldom unrewarded in the end. What? No one kiss us for a hundred years. There, la la la, I understand, my dears. Another. Further, the story would suggest a doubt that the marriage may be happier when deferred. Deferred, you cry? Deferred? I see your point. We'll skip this moral and attempt a third. Another. Thirdly, our able then appears to prove disparity of years, no bar to love. Crabbed age and youth, but that's an ancient quarrel, and I'll not interfere. There's no third moral. So thank you for listening. I hope you had a nice sleep. And remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye.